the law. The Bible unfolds God's progressive revelation. As such, it is unwise to study and interpret the Old Testament without consideration of the New Testament. Similarly, it is unwise to interpret the earthly ministry of Christ without consideration of the writings of the Apostle Paul. After all, God intended for the church age saint to consider the will of God through the lens of the revelation given to the Apostle Paul. This is an indisputable truth among all those who elevate God's word above man's opinions. Recognizing and implementing this principle enables the believer to understand the scripture within its proper perspective. Paul repeatedly emphasized this in verses like the following, 2 Timothy 2, 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. An equally important truth to understand is the fact that God revealed and instituted many of Paul's revelations prior to Paul's writings. Yet, these same truths remained unclear to the masses. One especially prevalent area where the Lord used Paul to provide additional light and clarity involves the purpose of the Old Testament law. Unfortunately, far too many people today read the Old Testament and the Gospel accounts and conclude that obedience to the Old Testament law was how men gained an entrance into paradise, at that time located in the heart of the earth. The Apostle Paul gave a much different perspective as he looked back on the purpose of the law. When one considers the totality of Scripture, he can emphatically state that God did not give the law to provide a means for salvation, but rather to bring man to a realization of his guilty condition, complete spiritual inadequacy, and pending condemnation. Romans 3.19 Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped in all the world may become guilty before God. Biblically speaking, God intended for the law to shut the mouths of all those looking to it for reconciliation and justification. After all, the standard of righteousness contained in the law was so lofty that only God manifest in the flesh could attain to its demands. John 1.14, 1 Timothy 3.16. God simply designed the law to reveal man's sin and his shortcomings concerning God's standards of righteousness. This understanding of the law drove men to trust the Lord and him alone. Paul expressed these truths in his testimony of the law's involvement concerning his own conversion. The law magnified Paul's sin and, as he stated, it was by the law Paul knew sin. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Romans chapter 7 provides insight indicative of the purpose of the law. God used the law in the life of unsaved men, Saul in this case, to bring awareness of one's sinful or lost condition. The desired outcome for Saul, Paul, was eternal life, but not before the law brought about his spiritual death. Once Saul was slain through an understanding of the law, he could look to Christ by faith to receive salvation. If this was true in the life of Saul, later changed to Paul, this pattern should be able to be traced throughout the Lord's earthly ministry. Without a realization of one's sinfulness, the individual will see no need to trust the Savior. The case of the woman at the well is a prime example. The Savior's methods brought about the desired results. While the average soul winner today would have led the woman at the well in a sinner's prayer the moment she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw, John 4, 15, Jesus uniquely responded, Go call thy husband and come hither, John 4, 16. Christ intended for his words to bring to light the woman's sinful condition. The woman's acknowledgement of her wrongdoing, John 4, 17, moved the Savior to reveal himself to her as the Messiah, John 4, 25 and 26, and her testimony says it all. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ, John 4, 29? Some of the more carnal brethren would point to Christ's words as a lordship salvation approach, 
but the Bible exposes these men as purely ignorant. No true Bible student would ever suggest that the answer to the woman's thirst and her hope of eternal life was granted based upon obedience to the law. She simply acknowledged her sinfulness and the light of truth was increased. Thus, we recognize that the purpose of Christ's dialogue with a woman was to reveal her sin and to bring her to faith in the Messiah. Paul confirmed these principles when he wrote, The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, Galatians 3.24. The law certainly did not gain this attribute only during the church age with a predominantly Gentile focus. Lawyer, impure motives, and ignorance. In addition to the woman at the well, the Lord applied this methodology when interacting with a certain lawyer. Unfortunately, many people have misunderstood this narrative, supposing the conversation with the lawyer promoted a works-based salvation as a primary example of justification of the law. Nothing can be further from the truth. From the very beginning of this interface, the narrator, the Holy Ghost, exposed the impurity of the lawyer's motives by stating that he tempted Christ and sought to justify himself. Luke 10, 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, that is Christ, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Luke 10, 29, But he, willing to justify himself, saith unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Shortly following this dialogue with the lawyer, the Lord warned in Luke chapter 11 concerning the lawyers of the law who were rebellious towards the law's precepts and who willingly and knowingly hinder others from adhering to those precepts. Luke 11:52. Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Isaiah prophesied of these religious leaders. He wrote that they were among those who honored the Lord with their words while their hearts led them astray. Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Jesus applied Isaiah's prophecy directly to his audience. The religious leaders said the right things, but their hearts were not right before God. Matthew fifteen seven, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Not only did the Holy Ghost expose this lawyer's improper motive, but the lawyer's opening sentence displayed his ignorance. While obedience to the law could yield a lengthening of one's physical life, Romans 10, 5, the law never allowed someone to gain eternal life. Additionally, the problem with the law was not the law itself, but rather the complete inability for any man to satisfy the entire law. The Bible repeatedly emphasized this fact. Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Romans 3.12, They are all gone out of the way, they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 8.3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son, the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 3.10 For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Paul clearly expressed the Jews' problem when he stated that they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3 This statement reveals that any man who sought or seeks to establish his own righteousness simply manifested an ignorance toward God's righteousness. 
That being said, it becomes quite obvious that the line of questioning from the lawyer revealed his ignorance in his attempts to establish his own righteousness. Luke 10:25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Because of the nature of the law, works undeniably were more prominent during the law's economy. God obviously intended for this to be the case. Yet God never designed the law to convince any man of his own self-worth and self-righteousness. Rather, God's stated standard of righteousness was designed to promote the pursuit of the righteousness of God by faith. Yet Israel repeatedly chose works in pursuit of their own righteousness. Unfortunately, man's natural propensity for pride tends to override that which is good and holy. The Jews, with the wrong heart's motive, were simply not right with God. In fact, their self-righteousness blinded them to the truth. They stumbled at the law's emphasis of works and blindly assumed themselves righteous. Romans 9.31, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. The cause of Israel's failure is undeniable. Israel sought righteousness by the works of the law rather than by faith. No statement in the Bible can be clear concerning God's desire for faith and the inability of works to attain righteousness. The Savior's Response to the Lawyer Characteristic of the Lord's methodology, instead of answering the question posed by the lawyer, the Savior replied with his own series of questions. Jesus knew the lawyer was attempting to ensnare him, so his questions were designed to expose the true nature and condition of the lawyer's heart. As is often the case, Christ's questions serve as the vessel to draw truth from the well of the man's heart. As such, the Savior had two primary questions. Number one, what does the law say? And number two, what does what you read in the law mean to you? Luke 10, 26, and he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Initially, the Savior allowed the man to dominate the conversation so that when Christ interjected, he would impact the broader audience for the greater good. This mode of questioning allowed the man to reveal his heart's condition, Luke 6.45. The man likely prided himself in his knowledge of the law. His answers demonstrated how much he knew and how superior his life was compared to others. Luke 10.27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbors thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. While the lawyer's answers revealed he was truly a student of the facts contained within the law, his unsavory motives had already been exposed. Although he had knowledge of the factual information of the law, he was ignorant to its intended purposes. Through Christ's continued questioning, the lawyer's answers would further expose his motives. In the end, he completely missed the point and the purpose of the law. Nonetheless, Jesus said, he answered right, Luke 10, 28, for love is, after all, the fulfilling of the law. For love is, after all, the fulfilling of the law. This truth was testified by Christ. Matthew twenty two thirty six. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And later confirmed by the Apostle Paul, Romans 13.10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Those teachers today looking to prove salvation by works during the ministry of Christ revel in their perception of the Savior's response. Yet in doing so, they behave more like a runner celebrating victory prior to crossing the finish line. They assume that the Savior said, This do, and thou shalt have eternal life. That is not what he said. Instead, the Savior actually said, This do, and thou shalt live. This distinction is crucial. After all, Paul later expressed that one's righteousness attained through keeping the law was incapable of giving eternal life. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. This lack of efficacy was not a problem with the law, but the fault was squarely focused upon man. Yet there are those who unwisely promote some type of faith plus work salvation system using the Savior's conversation with the lawyer. 
Think about it. The lawyer simply had to love God 100% of the time with 100% of his faculties. That is, with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, Luke 10, 27. The Bible is clear throughout its 66 books. God demands absolute righteousness for any person to be saved. Yet every man's best state falls short of God's just requirements, Romans 3, 23 through 26. Only a prideful and truth-rejecting lawyer would claim to live at such a level of self-righteousness, and only those blinded by man-made philosophies could remain ignorant of such an impossibility. In fact, the Lord confirmed that none of the religious Jews in his audience were even keeping the law. John seven nineteen. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? To further complicate the matter, obedience to the law was an all-or-nothing matter. James testified, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2.10 Triumphing under the law was not analogous to receiving a passing grade on a math or science test. Passing the law's requirements meant receiving 100% and only Christ ever attained to such lofty expectations. This does not mean that the law failed in its purpose. Instead, it wonderfully served its purpose of showing man his insufficiency apart from trusting God. Even under the law, God's emphasis and desired outcome always pointed to a man's heart condition. In fact, God repeatedly expressed his desire for a spiritually circumcised heart. Deuteronomy 10.16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. The lawyer's cross-examination. As the conversation continued, it became obvious that the lawyer hoped to discover some type of legal loophole in the law's dictates by limiting the scope of his neighbor, thus minimizing his responsibilities. Thus the lawyer voiced another question when Christ confirmed that he was to love his neighbor. And who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 29, but he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Once again, the Holy Ghost exposed the lawyer's ungodly motives. He was willing to justify himself. Most people who question the veracity of God's word are like this lawyer. Consider the implications of his self-perception. Number one, I have unfailingly loved God. And number two, if Christ limited the definition of neighbor, he had unfailingly accomplished loving his neighbor as well. He could feel justified. Christ, however, needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man, John 2.25. As such, the Savior understood that the man sought to justify himself or declare himself to be right. As before, the Savior met the man's questions by posing a question of his own. Prior to doing so, the Savior described an incident of a certain man who desperately needed help. After being injured, three different men crossed his path a priest, a Levite, and finally a despised Samaritan. Here's the account with a reaction from the first two, both religious leaders. Luke 10.30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. The nation of Israel held the offices of priest and Levite in the highest esteem. These men were to know the truth and live as examples for others to emulate. They were generally recognized proponents of the law and strong supporters of the truths contained therein. However, their lack of love demonstrated toward this stranger in need revealed that the law was known by them but not believed or lived by them. These two men held the truth but did so in unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. After these two religious leaders avoided this man, another man approached but reacted appropriately. He was a hated Samaritan, an offspring from a Jew who had intermarried with a Babylonian. Samaritans were viewed by the Jews as no better than the despised Gentiles, if not worse, John 8, 48. Yet this Samaritan demonstrated the type of love required by the law. Luke 10, 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. 
And he went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave to the host and said unto him, Take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. According to the Samaritan woman at the well, the Samaritan possessed limited knowledge of the Lord and the scriptures. In fact, when the Savior spoke to this Samaritan woman, he pointed out, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, John 4.22. Despite her limited knowledge, she demonstrated great faith when she said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things, John 4.25. Ultimately, knowledge of the truth for the religious leaders proved insufficient. If a man lacked the faith and the knowledge he possessed, the knowledge was useless. Of the three men, the Levite and the priest possessed the greatest level of knowledge, but lacked the faith to act upon the knowledge possessed. Had they exercised faith, their actions would have demonstrated the faith they possessed. After all, James testified, I will show thee my faith by my works, James 2.18. True faith can always be seen through the actions faith produces. The Levites and the priests' lack of action test to their faithlessness in the law regardless of its familiarity. The Samaritan, with his limited knowledge, demonstrated faith when he had compassion on the man traveling to Jericho, Luke 10.33. While the Samaritan may have lacked the vast storehouse of knowledge concerning the scripture possessed by the Levite and the priest, he had the work of the law written in his heart. He simply exercised faith in that truth. Romans 2.12 for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The inquiring lawyer sought to justify himself, yet the Savior pointed to a man justified before God by his faith in the work of the law written in his heart. His justification the sight of men was due to the demonstration of his faith through the compassion, the subsequent care of the injured traveler. Instead of personally answering the lawyer's question, the Savior allowed one more opportunity for the lawyer's own words to become judge and jury. Luke 10, 36, which now these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Evidently, this lawyer was not as pure as he had envisioned. The answer of the Savior was that the lawyer would not find eternal life until he became like the Samaritan. Before the Samaritan ever approached the injured traveler, he had exercised faith in the truth he possessed. The injured traveler merely gave him opportunity for others to see what was already in the man, true faith. In fact, Jesus already answered the question elsewhere concerning the means by which one could obtain eternal life. John 3.15 and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In Luke chapter 10, the Savior's answer was tailored to his audience because he knew man's thoughts. Luke 6, 8. If a lawyer came to him wanting to justify himself through works, that lawyer needed to first learn the impossibility of obtaining eternal life from keeping the law. Next, he needed to understand that his view of his own righteousness was completely skewed. Christ simply used the law to prove his point. The law gave the knowledge of sin to this lawyer and served as a schoolmaster to bring him unto Christ. If the lawyer's heart was seeking the truth, the law would make known to him his sinful condition. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Galatians 3.24 Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, 
that we might be justified by faith. While considering Galatians chapter 3, note that it was earlier in that chapter, Paul debunked the idea that the law was given to assist someone in becoming righteous. No law could be given to achieve such a lofty goal because the doer would have to keep it without ever failing or faltering. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Again, there was never a problem with the law. It was a problem with the sinfulness of man and his complete inability to live a sinless life. The law could offer a relationship with God through the sacrifices and especially a lengthening of lifespan, but never justification before God. Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. God's law is described as the truth. Psalm 119, 142, good. 1 Timothy 1, 8, holy. Romans 7, 12 spiritual, Romans 7, 14, and light, Proverbs 6, 23. But it was weak through the flesh and could not grant eternal life. Those claiming otherwise make God's word a lie, which means that it cannot be trusted. The choice is yours, God's absolute truth or man's habitual lies. Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The Testimony of a Rich Young Ruler A good Bible student understands the biblical importance of multiple witnesses when establishing the truth, Matthew 18, 16. If the woman at the well and the lawyer were not sufficient, the ministry of Christ also offers the account of a rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 16 through 25. He approached Christ, knelt before him, Mark 10, 17, and acquired about having eternal life. Like the previous example, Jesus first addressed the man's perspective and motive with a question. Are you calling me good because I am God or for some other lesser reason? Matthew 19, 16. Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus responded that all one must do is keep the commandments. Like the previous inquirer, the ruler asked which ones. This time, the emphasis was not placed upon loving God 100% of the time, but instead was directed to specific commandments supposedly kept by the ruler. Matthew 19, 18, he saith unto him, which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? The rich young ruler, like the lawyer, Luke chapter 10, indicated that he met the standard. As a result, he questioned if there were more. Knowing the man's heart problem, the Savior narrowed the requirement to expose that this man had not kept the law since his youth. Jesus knew that covetousness had taken root in the man's heart and as such told him to sell all that he owned. Would selling everything, giving away the proceeds, truly earn this man eternal life? Absolutely not. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus saith unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The Savior gave commandments to expose this man's lack of faith in his sinful condition. When the man went away sorrowful, the Savior testified of a common problem among the rich. They consider themselves self-sufficient and self-made. They tend to trust in those riches rather than trusting the all-sufficient God. The end goal was not to suggest a man could go and sell his possessions, thus earning salvation. Quite the contrary. It was to point out the one thing hindering the ruler from trusting in the true God. The companion passage found in Mark chapter 10 reveals the crux of the issue. This young man was religious, yet lost. He was moral, but lost. He had no assurance of salvation because he did not trust in the one that could save him, but instead trusted in his wealth. 
Mark 10, 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again, saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter in the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. Trusting is a matter of the heart. Apparently, the disciples were oblivious to Christ's point and wondered who then could be saved. To this, the Savior testified that salvation is only possible because of God. Those who trust in something else cannot. Those who trust in something else, anything else, cannot find eternal life. Mark 10, 26. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. The selling of the possessions was never the focus. Salvation was the issue. The selling of the possessions would simply be an outward expression of an inward change of heart. For every honest, open-minded saint, the manifestation of Zacchaeus' faith, when he too once trusted in his riches, should come to mind. Luke 19, verses 8 and 9. For the rich young ruler, the focus of his possessions was simply a symptom of an underlying problem. It was the heart attachment and trust in those possessions that made it impossible for this man to trust in the Lord. Ephesians 1.13 In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sadly, the Bible's two clearest passages about trusting in God alone for salvation, Mark 10.24, Ephesians 1.13, are changed with the removal of trust in most modern versions of the Bible. However, trusting in the Lord is not something unique to the New Testament. One needs to simply read the testimonies of Hezekiah, David, the Jewish fathers, the three Hebrew children, the fiery furnace, and many others. For instance, the testimony of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 2 Kings 18.5, he trusts the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and he departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. The testimony of David, king of Israel, Psalm 28.6, Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. The testimony of the Jewish fathers, according to David. Psalm 22, 4. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. The testimony of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, according to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 3.28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. The testimony of the holy women in the old time, according to Peter, 1 Peter 3, 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. There are many other examples of those who trusted in God. This is where Israel's blessings originated. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation. Unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. Psalm 68, 19, and 20. Yet there are, unfortunately, several examples throughout the Old Testament where God's people refused to trust in the God of their salvation. Psalm 78, 22, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. The next two examples look eerily familiar, like the rich young ruler trusting in his riches. Jeremiah 48, 7, For because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, Thou shalt also be taken, and Chemosh shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. Jeremiah 49, 4. Wherefore gloriest thou in the valleys, thy flowing valley, O backsliding daughter, that trusted in her treasures, saying, Who shall come unto me? Jesus framed the parable of the Pharisee and the publican with a rebuke toward those who trusted in their own righteousness. Luke 18, 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. 
both the Pharisee and the publican were esteemed by their respective groups. Both knew the importance of temple prayer, yet the Pharisee used the truth to condemn others while the publican saw the truth as a mirror reflecting his wretched state. The crux of the issue, the Pharisee trusted in himself, the publican trusted in God. Whether in the Old Testament or the New, a man had to trust in God or there was no hope of salvation. The Bible never teaches otherwise. Jesus saves. This is the end of chapter 23.